Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Meet Me here on Whose Blind Life Is It Anyway? I am your host, Victor Gouveia, and thank you for joining me on uh, this episode of Meet Me. Remember, if you enjoy what you hear, hit that like button. And if you think someone or anyone can benefit from what we say here, definitely share it and subscribe to our channel make sure you hit that live notification bell so you know when we go live and of course you can catch us on our facebook page or on twitter uh via periscope and periscope is no longer however you can still watch us on Peri on uh, twitter and uh don't forget you can check us out on podcasts everywhere anchor apple uh google spotify and um, if you need a copy of the audio or video for this episode, by all means, send me an email or DM me or, yeah, DM me, I think it's called, uh, <laughs> direct message, yeah, on Facebook or uh, Twitter, uh, or you can send me an email, whose blind life is it anyway, at gmail.com, and I will send you a link to the folder on Dropbox where you can download uh, a copy of the episode. As I said in my last episode of Meet Me, we are interviewing Zoe Fiocos. And I did say that there were two parts to Zoe's interviews. Uh, the first part concentrated on Zoe's early life. Uh, her childhood and her teenage years. And on this episode, we're talking about her 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, like I said, she's had a very eventful life. Uh, the, the bullying and the discrimination was ongoing. And so... I thought it was important that you all hear about it in case you were getting the same sort of thing happening to you. So join me now in listening or watching, if you have eyes, part two of Meet Zoe Fiocos. Enjoy, folks. <sighs> Actually, for some reason, I keep saying your name as Fiocos, which is the right way to say it. The second way, Fiocos, like, oh, Fiocos. Fiocos. Yeah, the K is silent, so it's just, you would pronounce it the G. Oh, really? The K is silent? I thought the G was silent. No. Oh, okay. All right. That makes sense. And it yeah. actually means bow tie. Fiocos <laughs> means bow tie? Yes. <laughs> wow. I miss So so you married a bow tie. Yes, and I became Mrs. Bowtie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, uh let's not make fun of your husband. Uh <laughs> it's okay, we're allowed. <laughs> well, yeah, only because we know him so well. And because he loves us and we love him. Well, he loves you. I don't know about me. <laughs> nah, he loves you too. Yeah. Um, as, I, as we said yesterday, uh, Zoe went through a lot of, of bullying and discrimination. And, I mean, her luck is just the worst. I mean, uh, even... Yesterday, she had a ton of bad luck when she was trying to upload the video to her channel. And it just wouldn't go for some reason. And today, it just went so easily for me. I I never, I can never understand why. I mean, it's like she's been cursed or someone or something. And and that scares me to no end. Because if if, if you got cursed by someone, then that means curses are real, and I am fucked. 
I'm sure you'll be okay. I mean, I've been cursed by so many people over my lifetime. Um, but anyway, I mean, one of the things, um, one of the things that I thought was really important, and unfortunately, we didn't cover it on the last interview, was an incident that happened with one of your teachers when you were in grade one. Yes. And I think this is important because a lot of people might be going through the same thing with their children or their students. Do you want to tell that story? Sure. Um, I had, a, of course, other than my family, I had a great support system in the fact that uh, the CNIB, my doctors, um, you know, there was a social worker of some sort. You called her something, a resource teacher or something. Yeah, like they're that. called resource teachers here in Canada. Right. She used to come in at the beginning of the year, uh, inform the teachers of my, you know, different needs from the other students. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like calling them special needs. I like calling them different needs. Right. Um, and she would visit me throughout three or four or five times out of the year. She would provide, make sure all my textbooks, you know, the large print or, um, you know, that the CCTV in the classroom was working, et cetera. Um, so she informed my grade one teacher of what needed to be done. And one of the things that uh, was said that when you write on the blackboard, speak out what you're writing because she can't see. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that the teacher was requested to do is whatever handouts she gave to the students, whether it was a, you know, a stencil of some sort or puzzle, whatever the case was, mm -hmm. uh, she was told that you need to enlarge this by such and such, you know, whatever, times eight or whatever the case was. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Um, but my teacher never did that. But I was too young to understand um, to go to my principal or my parents or whatever, you know, and say, excuse me, you know, Mrs. Naj isn't speaking. I don't know what she's doing on the blackboard or she didn't give me, I can't read this handout. Um, so she ended up failing me and uh, she said mm -hmm. that the reason she failed me was because her recommendation was that I will never make it in a uh, regular school, like a public school. It was a mm -hmm. public school, right? She right. said, I need to go to a special needs school. Um, and at that point, nobody had any reason to doubt her. And I was too young to understand what was going on to say, oh, that's not true or whatever. Right. Um, so I went to the school, which is, was called Jesse Ketchum. And uh, the teachers basically at the end of the year said, she's actually, she's, far more advanced for her age. And uh, we don't know why she was sent here. She needs to go back to public school. Right. So at that point, there started questioning by the resource teacher, uh, by the principals. They were all trying to figure out what's gone wrong. And eventually, you know, they questioned me and I said, uh, no, you know, Mrs. Naj never enlarged anything for me. She never, whatever. So they realized that this teacher didn't do her job correctly. Right. And I, I actually think she was transferred out of our school. And I, I don't know if that was the reason, but she was transferred out. So was that sort of a punishment to her that you didn't follow the instruction? I don't know. Um, but because of that, I failed a year, which I shouldn't have failed. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, it makes it sad that, but it, in my childhood years, that's the only thing that made me understand that there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Well, according to sighted people, there's something wrong with me. Right. You know, I didn't understand that concept. I obviously, we talked about it yesterday. I obviously got it in my teenage years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and, and I mean, that takes us into now. I mean, on yesterday's show, we talked about your childhood and your teenage years and i mean that was bad enough but now we're getting into your 20s and beyond and i mean that was a whole new level of bullying and discrimination for you wasn't it 
Yes. I mean, at at one point, there was a kid that pretty much followed you out of school and teased you mercilessly without fail. Yes. Even beyond that, I mean, do you want to tell everyone about that? Yeah, so I mentioned him yesterday briefly, but we got to the end of the interview. And I don't think I want to say too much because, I mean, you guys can all get the picture that my every time I stepped out of the house, one, let, let's just say my, my personality was split in two because one side was confident and I feel pretty and I feel confident and I feel independent and I'm off to do this wonderful thing, whatever it was, skating, horseback riding, dancing, mm -hmm. out with friends, whatever. And then the other half was, oh my God, I hope he doesn't appear around the corner meaning Paul, this particular guy, right. Paul, who actually was older than me. So you would think that if I was in my 20s, you know, 22, 23 years old, he probably was about 28 or whatever, 27. You think by then he would have matured and let this go. Everybody else had let it go. I mean, granted, we weren't in high school anymore. Others went to university, college, others were working, but I still saw a lot of people from high school. Sure. Yeah. And everybody seemed to let this finally go. But here came Paul. Paul, I stepped out of my home. He'd be screaming, the Cyclops is, has appeared. I'd go to church. He'd be in church. Now think of the concept. You're in church, praying to God, listening to a service, chanting, and I have him walking by me and say, hi, Cyclops, came to pray for a miracle. You know, like his constant badgering, constant, you know, I, in, a, in a club. I went mm -hmm. dancing with my friends. He'd ruin it for me. I would go to a restaurant on the Danforth. I would hang out. He'd ruin it for me. If this all finally ended, sort of, um, he decided to cause a scene in a restaurant where I hung out. And I was lucky because now I didn't have little girls around me sticking up for me. But I had basically all the staff of the restaurant. Uh, you know, men, 200 pound men and you know, six feet tall men and, and fathers and grandfathers and young men and even the owners, mm -hmm. they all stuck up for me and they kicked him out of the restaurant. And he, it's funny because he couldn't even understand why he was being kicked out. And I remember because the owner was a woman and she said, really? You think you're a man? Like you're making fun of a young woman. Why? What's the point? You know, mind you, even though I was crying endlessly, I did tell him off myself that day. So I finally spoke up. I finally let him have it. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of the last time I saw him because it actually, I think a year later, I got married. So I didn't really hang out at clubs anymore and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never saw him again, but I did find out, you know, two or three years later uh, that he actually passed away at 30 years old. And... Um, he wasn't even ill. He just, he was in construction work and he stepped on a nail and he didn't have his tetanus shot. I guess didn't pay attention to the injury. I guess got really infected or whatever the case was. He actually ended up dying. So, I mean, I've forgiven him. May the Lord forgive him. But the truth of the matter is for anybody out there who's been bullied, for it to follow you into your adult life and you have other things to deal with. Yeah. What you mentioned before, the discrimination. Mm -hmm. You know. And didn't, I mean, you told me a story about um, George sticking up for you too, right? Yes. And, and we mentioned that actually yesterday. He stuck up with me with that guy with the sexual assault. But George was older also, and he went to a different school. I think that if, like I had, I think I said this yesterday, if a whole bunch of guys got together and basically put these people in their place. Maybe things would have been easier for me. Do I blame them that they didn't? No, maybe they didn't think about it. Maybe I didn't, because I didn't want to- Make a scene. Yeah, I didn't want to make an issue. I just kept on hoping this will 
this will go away. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, a lot of times that's it, isn't it? I mean, the year in European cultures, a lot of times people don't want to make a scene instead of standing up to, for their rights. Right, and it, it wasn't that I didn't really stand up for my rights, but remember, I had rocks thrown at me. This and that. I was afraid. Right. What's going to happen to me? Right. Um, I. I and, and a form of bullying is not just the making fun. It's things like I would meet all these great guys and I would we would arrange dates and my friends would find out, my so-called friends, and they would go grab these guys and say, you don't want to go out with her. People are yeah. going to make fun of you. She's black. Isn't that sort of a form of bullying? Like they were destroying my relationships, my fun. Your reputation. My yes. reputation. But not only that young girl dating scene having fun this is where you're getting to know life yeah and these girls prevented me from you know teenage or young adult experiences mm. so that sort of a form of bullying to me it is it always was yeah. yeah yeah but i mean at this point you're going into the workforce right and i mean that was a, an experience all on its own Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, the first, I think, was the first job you got. Right. Where, I mean, you, I mean, they discriminated because of your eyesight. Yes. How? Um, I got the at, I got the job by fluke. A friend of mine had applied. The woman who was doing the interview, I tagged along, as best friends do in the at that age, I was um, 17 years old. So mm -hmm. I tagged along with my best friend. The woman who interviewed her, she was a wonderful woman, as I discovered later. Uh, she said to me, don't you want a job? And I said, excuse me? I said, of course I do, but nobody will hire me. She goes, what do you mean? I go, well, I've been looking for work, and they keep telling me, you, well, they keep using the excuse, you don't have experience. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand why every other teenager can get a job. Right. But I can't, you know? So she said to me, look. She goes, I personally don't care what's wrong with your eyes. She goes, and if you want to try, let's do it. So she interviewed me, gave me the job. Um, they explained to me that I had to do two days training, and then I had three months probation. Um, and this was for Pizza Pizza. I'm sorry. I don't think there's any reason I should hide what company this was. Right. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, for so those who don't know, Pizza Pizza is a national chain. Well, actually, is it a national chain? Because now that I think about it, I don't think I saw a single pizza pizza when I was out west. Maybe it's just Ontario? Maybe Toronto even, yeah. yeah. No, because Barry has one. Uh -huh. And I think I've seen one in Bancroft, which is, you know, three hours away from here or whatever. Right, right. Yeah, so I think it might be Ontario. Uh -huh. Of course, it's mostly Toronto, but anyhow. Right. Um. When I went to do my training, it was with a lady named Caroline, and I, I, I don't know if there was technology back then to help out on a computer. I mean, actually, I shouldn't say I don't know because I, I did get a computer when I was like sixteen, and they gave me this book that was bigger than an encyclopedia, and it said Word Perfect on it, and they gave me a whole bunch of things, and I, I just. I tried for a couple of days and it, what do you mean I'm going to spend my time reading this book? <laughs> I can't know. I sent the computer back and I said, I don't want to learn computers. Forget it. I want to go out and party. Right. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so when I was doing my training, the computer, I had to pull it right up to the edge of the desk and put the keyboard on my lap so that I can see what's on the screen. Right. And this was new to me. So I was a little bit slow and I was, I knew how to type, but I was slow because it was the first time I was really using a computer with regular print mm -hmm. and uh, lunch hour came and she approached me and just basically said, without any explanation, she said, I don't think you should come back after the lunch hour, just straight out like that. And I looked mm -hmm. at her and said, why, what have I done? <laughs> you know, um, and she said, well, 
your vision is way too low for this job. You can't do this job. Now, I've, I've at this point when she said this to me, I've had a total of four hours of training. Mm -hmm. But I had enough of, of a brain to, to say to myself, is this going to be too hard for me? Is this going to be easy for me? I knew that it would just take me a little bit of getting used to the screen, getting used to the keyboard. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I began to cry and didn't know what to do. I mean, she's a trainer, but is she like a boss to me? This was my first job. Is she telling, is this, is she asking me not to come back or is she telling me, mm -hmm. you know? So, and lo and behold, just as I was there crying, Emma appeared. Emma's the lady who hired me. So right. she saw me crying and she's like, what's wrong? I told her. And she said, come with me. And she took me by the hand and we went into the room and she said, Caroline, can I speak to you? And so, you know, the trainer came over and uh, she said, did you tell Zoe not to come back after lunch? She goes, yes, I did. She goes, for what reason? She goes, well, she can't do this job. And Emma said, you're a trainer. You can't decide that. I hired her. She has a right to two, two days of training and she has a right to three months of probation. If at the end of three months she cannot produce, okay, that's sad, but you cannot take that chance away from her. Yeah. You cannot take that opportunity away from her. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's funny because I, of course, I did the training and I passed the three month probation with flying colors. And I actually became one of their top call agents, mm -hmm. uh, operators. And sh this woman, Caroline, she never, for the rest of the time that I worked there, I doubt if she even ever said hello to me again. Like, I don't, and why? She should have been happy that I proved her wrong. But mm -hmm. anyhow, um, I continued to work there. I was making Believe it or not, back then, I was making a killing for my age. I was the girl that made the most money in, you know, in my crowd of friends or whatever. There was a lot of bonuses involved and uh, stuff like that. Anyhow, um, but one of the, one day, the president of the company decided to visit the call center. And this was in my second year working for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, he saw the way I was working and he panicked and they called me into the room and the manager that was on shift that day said to me, Mr. Overs wants you to sign documents that you're not going to sue pizza pizza if your eyes get ruined from uh, being so close to the computer. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I, again, I didn't know what to do, right? right. Um, I'm still very young. Back then, I didn't feel young, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Looking at it now, you're 19 years old. I mean, I don't know the laws. I don't know my rights. I knew that this was wrong. I felt it in my gut. And I began to, I went down for a cigarette on my break, and I was crying. And the union leader approached me, and I told her everything. She said, you are not to sign that document. And I said, Carol, if I don't sign it, they're going to fire me. She goes, they can't do that. Anyhow, they kept on pressuring me to sign these documents. And I just happened to have an appointment with my specialist at the uh, sick kids hospital. And I told him the whole story. And he said, leave this up to me. I'll take care of it. So he personally wrote a letter to Pizza Pizza and Mr. Overs. And I don't know if he's still the president of the company. And... It's okay. I don't hold grudges. But anyways, he um, wrote him a letter saying that it's been never proved scientifically that the computer can harm your eyes. Mm -hmm. And if it can harm, harm your eyes, it isn't going to make a difference if you're staring at the screen, you know, one foot away or a couple of inches away. Um, and this was 1989. Things may be different now, but, mm -hmm. you know. Anyhow, so they left me alone. And they didn't force me to sign any documents, but they started making my life really difficult. So they would, so the one of the a supervisor would come up to me and say, You told one of our customers to F off. And I'd be like, What? No, I didn't. 
why would I do that? And they're like, no, and this is your warning. And if you do it again, you'll be fired. I said, okay, I want to hear this recording. You guys say that you record for uh, training purposes. I want to hear the recording of me telling a customer to off. Of course, they couldn't provide that because it didn't it didn't happen. It didn't exist. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But they kept on doing stuff like that, changing my shifts, um, calling me in and canceling a shift and saying just really weird things. Well, it started becoming an issue. And at that point also, I felt confident enough to get another job. Right. I thought now that I have experience working, now that I can prove that despite my vision problems, I can actually produce, I can actually work. Mm -hmm. People are going to see that, that I have a resume where I was working somewhere and you were, so I gave up on pizza pizza and I quit. Mm -hmm. And I thought things would be different. <laughs> Again, I, I fooled myself. I was optimistic despite a bad experience, just like the bullying. I was optimistic that all people can't be that way. Mm -hmm. And this isn't going to happen to me again. It, it was a circumstance. Right. So I started looking for work. Nobody would hire me. So I decided, and back then, you didn't need to finish high school to go to um uh, college or, um, yeah, you, like could, a training you, could, or... you could go back as a mature student. Right. Right. So I ended up finding a course. It was called the, tra it was a, called the travel training career center. And it was a seven or eight month crash course mm -hmm. in becoming a travel agent. And I thought, wow, I've already traveled once alone. Um, to Greece. I went to Greece. Right. My parents uh, were already there, and I, I traveled on my own, and I was able right. to. Right. That, that. that was when you were exposed to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. yes absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I had already traveled on my own. I felt confident. I thought, you know what? I would love to do this job. And I, I always, when I was in school, I took French, English, Italian, Spanish, any language I could get my hands on, I would take it. Right. Um, so I thought, oh my God, if I did this job, I'd deal with airlines, I'd have the office look, you know, the office outfits, and mm -hmm. I'd be my own boss, and I'd have staff, and I'd be able to travel. You know, I, I loved it. So I took this, um, I went to sign up for this crash course, and I signed up for a student loan from the government. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom came with me to get the initial process started to sign up at the school mm -hmm. and the principal of the school was absent that day. So the, one of the top professors that was there, uh, he decided to do my whole uh, paperwork and all that stuff. So when he asked me to sign the papers, I put my nose to the paper and began to sign. And he was in shock. Even right. though I could write perfectly, I didn't leave the lines. I didn't scribble. My my writing was pretty good, meaning it was presentable. It, it was actually, some people say that I had a good, good writing skills. Mm -hmm. um, he said, I don't think you should take this course. I said, excuse me, why not? And he said, well, your vision is really bad. He goes, how are you going to fill out airline tickets? I said, sir. Yeah, in those days, folks, there were no printers to fill out airline tickets. They, they did filled it out by hand. By hands, yes. Right. Um, there was a, a, a like a press where they would once they filled out the um, airline ticket, they would put it in this sort of like sandwichy concoction thing, and they would press it down, and the logo of the airline would appear on the ticket. Right. Anyhow, um, and my mom stood up for me and said, look, it's our money to waste. And if she fails and falls flat on her face, that's none of your business. So there's another example of how I was judged according to my vision without being given a chance. Right. I finished the course with top honors and the last day of school when I was presented 
um, with the honor roll and I got my degrees and all that stuff. The, that particular professor said, you know, I'm not going to get into the whole speech, but he said, it's people like me who keep people like her from becoming great, from accomplishing, from striving. And he said, Why? well, remember he asked me not to take the course. Right. So now he's saying it's people like me. Oh, that uh, people like the professor. Yes. He's saying right. it's people like me who prevent people like her from becoming successful. Oh, I see. Okay. 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 And he apologized in front of the whole class. And he said, look, I asked her not to take this course and my deepest apologies. And he went on to actually tell them, you're going to go out there and you guys are going to become travel agents. And some of you may even open your own travel agencies and so on and so forth. Hire people like her. Don't be like me. You know, don't judge before the fact. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, that gave me confidence again. And I started to apply for positions in the travel field. Mm -hmm. And I kept on getting turned down. I kept on getting weird interview questions like, who does your makeup? Who asks that? How is that important to the position I'm applying for? Who does your makeup? Who dresses you? And I was like. <laughs> you know, I okay, look, speaking from a an employer point of view, one can say that asking a question like that might be important because you're not behind a phone. You're out there in front of people. And if you can't put makeup on right or you can't dress properly, you're going to look like a fool. Yes. but and I, you won't sell anything. Yes, but I, well, I'm being asked who dresses me, who or how are you getting dressed? Or how are you coming to work? How will you be traveling to work every day? Mm -hmm. TTC, like everybody else. Right. And then it's like, who does your makeup? I do. Really? You know, Victor, you had to live it, hear it, to understand it. Hear the intonation in their voice. Hear the... No, no, I get, I get what you're saying. You know, I, I don't, I don't begrudge how you felt. The fact is, it shouldn't have been asked. It wasn't something they needed to know. I'm just saying that I can understand from an employer point of view that somebody could ask you that and why they asked you. And, and actually, I, I can actually, um, the, the company, the, the interview that I was asked about my makeup and my clothing mm -hmm. was called Sky Service. Right. And this was a telephone service company. So what's, so what's, oh. I, hold on, what's I travel today? You yeah. know, travel.com. Right, you right. Call and you speak to an operator to book your ticket or flight or mm -hmm. whatever the case is. So actually with Sky Service, again, it shouldn't have mattered who did who did my makeup. Right. Like, right. Whatever. Anyhow, um, I kept on looking for work. I actually offered a few travel agencies to work for free for them for a year so that I can prove myself. Mm -hmm. And they said no. Um, and then I asked, and then I, I got a job. Well, I applied for a job. Can't remember exactly the name of the company. It was Fiesta Holidays. It was a cruise company that had merged with a tour operator. Mm -hmm. And they merged. They were called something like Fiesta Carnival or something like that. I can't remember now. Mm -hmm. And their offices were on Avenue Road, which is sort of, you know, a high-end oh, area. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I went and applied for this job, and the woman who was doing the interview, a wonderful, wonderful woman, God bless her soul, wherever she is, uh, we hit it off right away. And she said to me, look, she goes, you're about the, you know, 22nd person I'm interviewing, and I've got three left. But I'm telling you right now that you've got the job. 
She goes, I love your attitude. I love everything about you. Your, your grades are absolutely fantastic. Um, the way you carry yourself, you're perfect for this position. And the position itself was actually me being a trainer for travel agents. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, a big part of that training was to teach travel agents to move into the uh, computer field of things. So not to do bookings by hand anymore, to do bookings online. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, programs like they were called Sabre and Apollo, and they were different programs. Mm -hmm. And I would be teaching travel agents to do this. And I would also be helping them in their travel agencies with different, um, anyhow, different advertising and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I would be on the field a lot. And she said, you'll have your corner office. These will be your benefits. This will be, we discussed everything. I was ecstatic. Mm -hmm. And I said, finally, I finally have someone who believes in me and I've got the break I need and, you know, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, a few days later, she called me privately, actually. And she said, unfortunately, they've asked me to choose somebody else and not hire you. And I said, why? I was in shock. You know, like, what have I done? You know, it was always, what have I done? I always thought it was me. Mm -hmm. And she said, Zoe, you didn't do anything wrong. She goes, they just don't want a disabled person uh, working for them because they're afraid of the liability. They're afraid of suing. What if something happens to you? What if you blame it on them because of your disability? They, just, it's just a whole bunch of things yeah. that they're afraid of. And I said, well, I should sue. And she said, you should. But unfortunately, I have a family to think about. I've got four kids mm -hmm. and I won't be able to be a witness for you. I wish I could. She said to me in another life, justice should be done. And I should be there to say she was perfect for the job, but they didn't allow me to hire her. But I won't do it because it's not that I don't care. I've got mouths to feed. So I cried and I said, thank you very much. And I still kept on trying for a while, but then I finally just gave up. I, I gave up. I gave up on my dream. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually gave up because at one point I thought maybe I should just go back to high school, finish and go to university and do something. You know, But at that point I had already these so much discrimination, so much bullying that I kind of gave up on my dreams. And the truth of the matter is I had gotten married just after this incident, I got married. And I thought, well, this isn't so bad. I always wanted to be married and I've always wanted to be a mom. So, mm -hmm. I said, so what if I'm not a career woman? Right. So what if I can't do the things I love? I am going to do something I love, raise children. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't work out either. <laughs> right, right. I didn't have children either. I mean, I've had two very severe miscarriages, but violent miscarriages, but, um, and there was another incident with work. I did finally get a job, not in a field that I wanted. It was just like a telecommunications company of some sort. And I just got a very low end paying job and that was fine. Mm -hmm. I didn't care. I wasn't looking to be, you know, the CEO of a company or something like yeah, that. No, I get it. I get it. <laughs> um, you were just looking for something. Exactly. To pay you. Yeah. And, they installed some new computer system and the man who installed it was from Quebec. And I guess he had switched the language to French because that was his native tongue. Well, when he left, he forgot to switch the language back. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you have this company, including the bosses and all the employees and all the accountants, and they don't know how to use this system. Mm -hmm. And for my luck, nobody spoke French. And I say for my luck because... I didn't speak French either, but I watched. So see, my vision was really good. I watched this man install this program and I watched him. I watched him how he used it and so on and so forth. So when they had problems, um, I said to the boss himself, I said, excuse me. I said, sorry to bother you. I said, but do you want me to help you with that? Mm -hmm. He goes, what do you mean? I go, well, I see that you're having a problem getting the system running, but I know how to get it running. 
goes, how do you know that? I said, well, I just do, <laughs> you know, he goes, yeah. at this point, he goes, I have nothing to lose. And he goes, do you speak French? I said, no, he goes, do you, I said, I don't need, I don't need to speak French. I know what I'm doing. Watch. So I fixed it and I got it running and he looked at me and said, okay. And he went to his wife and he said, you know, we have a really smart girl working for us and none of us have ever paid attention to her. And the next morning they called me into the office, both husband and wife and said, we're really sorry. We never paid attention to you, but as of right now, would you like to be the super, uh, supervisor? And I was in charge of, uh, employees, mm -hmm. make sure they're doing their job correctly, their schedules, whatever. I became a supervisor. Mm -hmm. So from this really low end job, all of a sudden I was a supervisor. <laughs> you know what I mean? Once um, you proved yourself. Well, exactly. I had to right. prove myself. And that I mean, did it eventually get changed to English? Yes. Yeah. And actually I ended up changing it to English for them, um, which is funny, but I was unlucky there again because the company ended up moving. I don't know where Australia. Another country. Yeah. Yeah. And I just couldn't follow. Right. right. So that there goes that. So just as I got lucky or got a break, well, we're back to unlucky again. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. You know, and I want to say that word. You just said something to me. You said you, once you got, um, you what, proved yourself. Yes. All my teenage years, twenties and thirties, that's exactly what I felt every single day that I had to prove myself to people. Right. I had to prove I could do it. You know, I, I, when I got my first computer in 2002, I turned it on and I looked at it and said, oh, it's very pretty. What do I do now? And I basically taught myself um, to the point that my friends were calling me and saying, Zoe, can how you do we me? do this? Yes. How do you yeah. do that? Whatever. Mm -hmm. And I actually started making my own invitations, wedding invitations and um, different things like that. Like I was using a Microsoft publisher. Mm -hmm. And I was creating, designing my own uh, gifts, my own cartoons, my own little things. I was piecing things together. I was, you know, what, and I was making these wonderful, wonderful things. But my site started to fail. Right. And that's, I mean, I think I, I, I touched on this briefly yesterday uh, during the introduction you started seeing pretty good, but then at some point your vision declined so much <coughs> that you had to start using JAWS and voiceover. Yeah. So if you remember when I got my computer from you guys the first time, mm -hmm. you guys gave me Zoom text and actually Victor's the one who insisted that I also get JAWS. And I kept on saying, I don't need JAWS, you know, and Victor said, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. You don't know what's going to happen to your vision. And I kept on saying, but I've been told my vision is never going to be changed. And Victor said, well, I beg to differ in the sense that things can happen that you're not waiting for. Yes. And so he did install JAWS. And guess what? A few years later, I needed it because diabetes hit me where the eyes are. Mm -hmm. uh, type 2 diabetes. I was diagnosed when I was 28. And I ended up getting severe cataracts in my eyes and cornea disease. Right. They took the cataracts out, made things a little better. And then in 2018, my cornea completely broke. Right. Um, and this was actually before my trip to Israel. So I panicked and I said to the doctor and he said, no, go on your trip. Have a wonderful time because it, there's a six month waiting period. You aren't going to have your surgery until uh, February of 2019. Right. When I discussed my situation with my doctor, he actually said to me that I expect and hope that you will have the vision you had when you were 20. Because the reason for your vision loss right now was the cataracts and the cornea disease. Mm -hmm. 
So I went into that surgery really optimistic. And by the way, heads up, they don't put you to sleep for that surgery. So it was really scary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, <laughs> anyhow. And I came out of the surgery and when they took the the coverings off my eye two, three days later, nothing had changed. Everything was really blurry. And I panicked and the doctor said, no, no, this is a long process. It'll take one, two years for recovery. You need to go on rejection drugs. You need to do this, you need to do that. Well, so now we're in 2021. And unfortunately, everything is really blurry. My, my vision is there. I, mm -hmm. can see the, I can see the shapes of the buildings across the street, but I can't make out colors. I can't make out faces. I can only make out contrast. I do have a CCTV. I do have glasses. They found glasses to help me read a little bit. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I can't make out anything like colors and faces and all that. And they're saying that the new cornea, because I had a full transplant, caused severe astigmatism. Wow. And as far as they know, they haven't figured something out to help me. One doctor suggested I get a contact lens um, put into my eye so it can flatten the cornea a little bit to help. Right. But I haven't tried it yet. But so here I am again, a new, you know, I've had these strange disease. I've had all surgery with my eyes, bad luck with my eyes. Yeah, <laughs> no, I know. I know. I... And you know what? I mean, that's, uh, that's something that I've always, uh, that's a philosophy I've always thought of as important to plan for the future, even though things might be going good now because you never know what's going to happen in the future. And I think I learned that from when I went blind because I put off learning how to be blind while I was doing all these surgeries and blah, 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 blah. And my rationale was, well, I don't know what my vision's going to be. So let's wait until then. Yes. Well, guess what? No vision, <laughs> no vision at all. And it's like, no, you can't go on that hypothesis. You have to go on the premise that at some point, God forbid, your vision might go completely. Exactly. Which is, you know, at this point, even though I'm considered visually impaired, I personally consider myself blind because, I mean, I can't see colors. I can't see unless... Like even outside, I can't distinguish the sidewalk from the boulevard, like from the grass line, unless I'm wearing these sort of special glasses and it's not always a hundred percent. Like I can't, I have to use a cane. Mm -hmm. I have to definitely use a cane. So um, I just want to, this actually isn't planned, but I want to say thank you to you for something. You also taught me to use the iPhone. And it was made back when with the 4S. Right. And I remember being so nervous about it. And you said, it's nothing. Just here, play with my phone and, and look and ask questions. And I was like, what is this? You know, touch screen. What is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you're the one who really taught me how to use the iPhone. And the iPhone really did open up uh, a new world for me. Right. Um, just in, in many, I use it on a daily basis. Like if my iPhone goes my praying goes, my recipes go, my edit, movie editing goes, my everything. Like I use the iPhone absolutely for everything. And right. it's thanks to you and thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I mean, you know what? You're not the only person I recommend the iPhone to. Um, I recommended it to another best friend of mine. And unfortunately she hasn't taken to it like you have mm -hmm. um she's not as advanced now whether that has to be because she's 10 years older than me i don't know right but at the same time i tell her you know you can you can do this with the phone you can do that with the phone and it just 
she doesn't get it. You I know, mean, you, know you, both you and I are 50 and, and we've noticed that we're very forgetful compared to 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. You're saying this person is 10 years older and, and you know, who knows? Oh yeah, no, I mean, yeah. I've noticed the memory losses in her too. Right. But, um, you know, I, I recommend to all new, especially newly blind people to get onto the iPhone. Because whether we like it or not, touchscreens are technology now. Um, I mean, you'd be really hard pressed to find a phone with buttons. Right. LG still has a phone with buttons. Uh, just like uh, I was going to say Samsung. <coughs> Sorry, pardon me. I It's very dry. Yeah, it's very hot today, and I have the air conditioning on, and it's very dry, so I'm getting a really scratchy throat. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> but um, those, I mean, even the buttons are getting really flat paneled. Right. To the point where it's really, I, for example, I prick my fingers all the time for my diabetes management. It's three o'clock. Thanks. And I... I <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like it's getting to the point where, you know, I can't even feel these buttons. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, even when, uh, God, my first talking phone was a Nokia 6687. Which you also recommended to which me. Which I also recommended, yes. And, you know, I mean, there were plenty of other phones I could have gotten with a QWERTY keyboard and stuff. But... I just couldn't. I like. I got so proficient in, ty in typing with the number pad, right? That I didn't want to switch to the QWERTY keyboard, right? You know, and who the hell wants to switch to a QWERTY keyboard that's so tiny <laughs> on a freaking phone for crying out loud? Anyway, it got. To, I mean, you know what? You have to move with the times. Otherwise, you're going to get left behind and things aren't going to go your way. And I think that's a nice philosophy to have, to look to the future rather than trying to stay in one place. Yes. Because it's comfortable. So, I mean, there's that. I mean, but that's not, I mean, at this point, you've started something new in jewelry. Well, I actually started in 2016, but because of my illness and my trip to Israel and my eye surgery, I kept on having to put it on hold. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I was a woman in my younger years who I loved my costume jewelry and I loved wearing earrings and bracelets and stuff like that. Right. So I decided, I don't know how this got into my head, but I decided that I want to make my own. Well, I had done a bit, a bit, a bit of traveling and I had bought some stuff and I saw, and I said, Oh, these are, beaded oh this is straight whatever um so i decided that i want to do this um but like i said i kept on getting put off because of other circumstances um i did end up i was invited to uh two different functions to sell my stuff mm -hmm. and i got a lot of good feedback um i also got some suggestions like some women said to me you know, you should make these in two sizes, like a mother-daughter combination. Because there were some little girls who, for example, they saw a, a, a bracelet with a butterfly, mm -hmm. but it was way too big for a five-year-old, for example. Right. So, you know, the women said, you know, if you made this as a set, mom and daughter, like the, the butterfly, we would, we would, we would have bought this. You know, we were mm -hmm. like, anyhow. Um, it's funny. The one function I a lot of my now, I don't make expensive jewelry. I think my most expensive piece is probably about $25 or $30. I did, at one point, I did make a more expensive piece uh, 
with uh, Swarovski beads, but that was for a special occasion. Um, I haven't done anything that expensive, but the most expensive, let's say, is about $25 to $30. Um, I don't mold my own jewelry. I do shape things. Mm -hmm. I do shape wires and strings and whatever the case may be. I do use uh, stainless steel. I use silver. Um, I use silver plated. I use gold plated. I have, uh, I design my own designs. I mix and match. So I'm kind of out there, meaning I'll mix wood with glass. Mm -hmm. And I do different things. Now, I don't see colors. So I, I, I remember colors. Right. I remember what light pink looks like. Mm -hmm. So I came up with a labeling system. And I actually have it right next to me. Hold on. Uh, I did have it next to me anyhow. So, for example, I don't know if the camera can actually pick this up because who knows if I'm pointing at the camera. Nice. This, yeah. Well, I'm going to hold it right where my chest is under my chin. So that way for sure. This is just a bin full of beads. Uh -huh. And I got, you know, the pen friend. Right. I put a label on it so when i tap my pen friend it'll say something to the effect of for example i don't know what this is right now but it'll say red one or blue five or whatever and i'll open up my computer um and i have these files both on my mac and on jaw um windows and i'll open up the document called for example blue one and then i'll open up the bin itself and the bin has slots. So the first bit, um, I'll look and it'll say slot one, five millimeter crystal blue beads. Like it'll give me a description. Right. It'll give me the price. For example, this bead costs two cents or five cents or 25 cents, whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. um, so then I pick out the beads I want. I make a picture in my head. Sorry, I'm just putting that away. Um, I make a picture in my head. And then I begin to construct it, whether it's with string or a fish line or wire or bangles or anything like that. I make, so what I do make is I make earrings, bracelets, uh, necklaces, and I also make witness pins. Right. Do you know what a witness pin is? Uh, not offhand, no. So for when we baptize our children, the godparents will go around to all the guests and they will pin on your lapel, they'll pin something like with a bow and a cross hanging from it. That means you're a witness that this person was made into a Christian. This person was baptized. Oh, I see. Okay. So I make those types of things. Um, and I make, actually, I do something a little bit more modern. I don't do the lapel ones too much. I do do them, but not too much. I actually make witness bracelets. So um, the funny thing is I taught myself. And actually, if I look at what I started making in 2016, they're pretty, but now I can see the flaws or feel the flaws or whatever. Um, I taught myself. I did Google as your friend. I asked questions on Google. I tried to get my mind to work. I ruined a few things. <laughs> I threw things across the room saying, yeah, this isn't happening. Right. You know? Because I'm sure you know what crimping is, right? Yes. So imagine this very tight space next to a bead where I've got to add a buckle and I need to crimp two wires together with this one millimeter little tiny crimp. And you've got to stick a, oh, a plier there and, and figure it out. It took me a while to master crimping. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, again, I'm very proud of this because I taught myself. I've gotten great feedback. I have sold a few things to friends and I, like I said, I did those two functions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping to start this up again. Um, before I say that, I just want to say that the earrings I'm wearing, it's, it's a long seashell. Now in Greek, we call them kohilia, but I don't know what they're called in English. It's, it's an ocean. Well, you said it, seashell. But it's the long ones. I don't know if in English you guys have different names for the ones that are kind of round or for the ones that are long. 
I don't think so. Yeah, okay, well, in Greek, we do that way. I'm getting confused. It's a long gold seashell that's hanging, and then underneath, a blue, round, sparkly seashell is hanging from the long one. So that's the earrings, and I'm wearing them. And the bracelet- Aren't those kind of earrings called dangly? Dangle earrings? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Yes. So the bracelet I'm wearing, it's a gold bangle, and I'm just gonna remove it for a second. It's very easy to remove by yourself because there's no clips and buckles um it's well obviously i like i said i do silver i do string i do leather but i do gold and silver today i just happen to be wearing the gold so the bangle i'm holding in my hands and i'm just going to hold it sort of in front of my mouth so i know the camera is getting it um it's got white matte beads with gold leaves surrounding them and then it's got clear for those who know what pandora is it's got clear uh pandora style beads and there's a the center bead is a um a blue green bead with rhinestones right. so they're very pretty and i just want to show you one more that i'm really proud of this one is it's got a huge pink bead in the center with a square frame around it and then it's got neck on either side it's got gold beads with square frames and then it's got clear and pink beads along with some gold teardrops and there's a heart bead hanging at the bottom of the bracelet a big gold heart so i do these things i i'm proud of them and i hope to have the business up and running soon i'm working on it but one of the reasons I'm delayed is because of the other wonderful things I'm doing, which is Wait. My, cooking. What? What? <laughs> my cooking. Right. And we'll get to that in a second, though. I mean, where can people go to learn more about your jewelry? Well, like I said, there is a page on Facebook. If you just type in Blind Kisses. Mm -hmm. that's the name of the company um i used to be on etsy but right now like i said i'm because i'm working on getting this up and running again mm -hmm. um people aren't really gonna find too much out there so let's let's just put it on hold and say you know we'll give you more details later when i have everything up and running you know uh pricing and maybe at some point we can even i can show people how i be yeah. um, this accomplishment, and just before we move on to the next and I think final step, I think I just want to say, and if you don't mind, because you know I talk a lot, but um, I just want to say to women out there, and even men, blind or sighted, I am a living example of sexual assaults, bullying, discrimination, bad luck, surgeries strange illnesses family drama anything you can think of i got it we don't have time we do five interviews but i'm optimistic i love life i'm 50 and i won't stop dreaming i believe that i can do anything i set my mind to i've got good friends i've got a great support system i've got love i've got a parent who's still alive, who supports me in anything I do. I've got a husband who never thought of, never thought twice when he wanted to marry me and we didn't even know each other. It was an, almost, an, almost an arranged marriage mm -hmm. and he didn't care that I couldn't see. And he's been my rock. Um, and I've, I'm gonna stop saying that I need to prove myself. I no longer have to prove myself. I can do it all because I say I can, because mm -hmm. I know I can, because I've got the willpower, because I've got the Lord's help. Right. And no matter what happens, we need to move on. We need to forgive people. We need to love. We need to not dwell on the past and woe is me. I, I think that there's so much out there. Every day is a new start. I garden, I cook, I make jewelry. I do so many things. Right. Should I spend my life crying? 
No, I just want to laugh. I just want to have a good time. Right. I want to spend my time praying when it's time to pray and the rest of the time loving my friends, family, and just being strong. I just, I want people to be strong, learn to be strong. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean get violent. That doesn't mean get vicious because remember I said I did get vicious at one point, you know, and, and that's but it ended up biting you in the ass. Exactly. And that's not a good thing. Right. So no matter how many stumbling blocks I come across, I know I'll get, I will get over them mm -hmm. and I will succeed in the end. Right. And again, for me, and I'll, you know, thank the good Lord in all his glory and all his wisdom and the love and support and power that he gives me, it comes only from him. And I'm so grateful to yeah. everybody, my friends, my family, and of course, God. So that's what I wanted to say. And speaking of having fun, I, on the last episode, I mentioned that there would be a, a huge surprise on this part of the interview. And we're at that moment now. When I first got back in touch with Zoe, after a long number of years we hadn't talked, it was like no time had gone by. And one of the things I knew from our friendship was how much of a cook she was. I mean, once you've had her Easter cookies, you don't want any others. <laughs> Yeah, just letting you know, folks. So anyway, I I spoke to her about doing an interview. But when I spoke to her, I also mentioned about her doing a show for our network, that being Whose Blind Life Is It Anyway? And she agreed. And she agreed, and in fact, she got a, an idea of her own to create her own channel. Now, um, without the help of Victor again. Oh, let's not mention that. So, I mean, I really don't want to talk about the bad luck you have. <laughs> <laughs> no, but again, it's thanks to you. Yeah, but no. Well, it, not it's, bad luck thanks to you. Well, so, you know. Bad luck. <laughs> but at the same time, you know. Uh, but anyway, folks, I mean, it's something that I think will go gangbusters on our network and on her channel, for that matter. Uh, the fact is, do you use a lot of gadgets? Um, blind? you know what I, I do, but it's not just gadgets in the kitchen. When you're blind, mm -hmm. you have to use all senses, my ears, my smell, even I use my hands. I use my tape. Like everything is so important, especially for a blind person. Most sighted people just use their eyes. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks brown, it's done, or whatever the case is. Right. I use everything. I use my ears to know if something's boiling. I need you you need to use all your senses. However, gadgets have made my life easier. Um, I use a talking scale, I use the pen friend, I use um different sort of slicers to make things easier for me. I'm not that good with a knife. I do use knives, but I'm, I'm a little slower. So I mm -hmm. found gadgets and everybody's going to find the gadget that suits them, you know, but I, I, there's a lot of tricks and tips and I hope I can show everybody. I, I love to cook. I love to bake. And, and I'm not going to say that Pardon me, accidents don't happen. Accidents happen. I've made recipes where I failed and I've had to redo them. That's normal to me. 
you know, a lot of these shows that we see on TV, you think that it's one take and they're done. God, no. And, and I, I've actually read blogs where people are saying, you know, by the time I got this recipe right, you know, I, I tried this and I tried that and I tried this. Well, this is the final product. This is what works after, you know, whatever, 10 times. So I'm not saying that every recipe I present is going to take somebody 10 times to make it. What I'm trying to say is it's okay to fail and try. You know, what is that? What's that saying, Victor? Try, try and... and if you fail, try, try again. Something like that. Try and you'll right. succeed or something. I, anyways, I don't remember it exactly. But that's the truth. I have made some. Oh, I know what you're saying. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Yes, that's the point. Yes. Thank you. See? Yeah. 50 calling. Never mind. Yeah. Um, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've gotten to the point that I cook so well that I've actually showed my mom. A, you know, one or two new things. So my mom, she's she's a fantastic cook, but she's in her 70s and she's set in her ways and her traditions and her recipes. And I've showed her some twists and things. And she's, you know, she's like, honey, you always impress me, you know, or whatever the case is. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm the best cook in the world, but I definitely make my family happy. And I definitely, well, I make Victor happy with my cookies. Oh, God, um, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. you know, so yeah no and ladies and gentlemen her channel and the show here on on whose blind life is it anyway is called zoe's blind kitchen corner and it premieres every thursday uh not any specific time but it'll be out every thursday and we're premiering the episodes at the same time on her channel and mine. So make sure you tune in July 1st for the very first premiere episode of Zoe's Blind Kitchen Corner. With any luck, we won't get flagged for copyright issues or anything <laughs> like that. <laughs> Uh, I uh, mean, you're referring to my intro, aren't you? <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, see, I yeah, am. And, and when they see the intro, they'll understand what a big oh, and hard I am. You know what? I've gotten so many copyright uh, issues already from Google. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. From YouTube? Oh, yeah. Like crazy. But okay. I challenge each and every one of them. Okay. Yeah. So, and I haven't lost one yet. And how do you think this one's going to go? <laughs> We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> well, this is different. I mean, the one we're doing with yours is an intro for the show. Right. And so maybe it'll get flagged. Maybe it won't. I don't know. We'll have to see. Okay. Yeah. But, folks, make sure you tune in on July 1st, Canada Day. Happy Canada Day. Absolutely. Happy Canada Day. And... Check out Zoe's Blind Kitchen Corner here on Whose Blind Life Is It Anyway? And on Zoe's Blind Kitchen Corner. Yeah, Zoe's Blind Kitchen Corner. <laughs> I will put the link to Zoe's YouTube page um, in the description box below. Uh, now, you're probably wondering why is Zoe starting her own channel? Now, there is a reason for that. <clears throat> because I have shows that are fairly uncensored, especially the Saturday Night Adult Party or SNAP, Zoe needs a channel that people can tune into her show and not worry about what other shows are on the channel. So that's why her show is currently on a separate channel as well. Um, it's just being added to Whose Blind Life Is It Anyway as a network because it's because a network. There is my support and he's always healthy and I'm not going to turn my back. There will be an episode always on your network and my YouTube channel. Yes. 
Um, having said that, I want to apologize to our readers. While I shouldn't be doing this in your interview, I, I have to do it anyway. Um, I am I am almost done the editing for Mary Storr's um, Cooking with Four Senses. So make sure you check that out. I'm going to be releasing that fairly soon. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah, I know. Um, so we're going to have two uh, cooking shows. Hopefully Mary decides to do more. I don't, she hasn't actually said anything to me yet, but you know, as time goes by, I'm sure, uh, with hopefully with popular requests, people will want to do it. Um, also if you have a special recipe that you'd like Zoe to try, by all means, sure. send, send me an email whose blind life is in any way at gmail.com. Or you can send it to Zoe's Blind Kitchen Corner. That's Z O E S Blind Kitchen Corner at gmail.com. And uh, if it's within our, well, if it's within Zoe's power, she'll do the recipe. Absolutely. Uh, if it isn't, then we're sorry, but, you know, we're not. We're not, um, what is that guy? The Hell's Kitchen guy. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember his name. Yeah, I don't remember his name offhand. That's but how I, bad we are. Yeah, I will definitely try. Yeah. I mean. And, and I love new recipes. I love to experiment. So. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> like I said, I mean, I'm going to be guest starring on her show at some point in the near future, as well as my wife, who will be teaching her how to make uh, Filipino noodles, otherwise known as panzit. Um, and like I said, I mean, those noodles usually take forever because of the prep time, not because of the actual cooking. But uh, like I said, we've got a lot. Can you tell them some of the recipes you've cooked on your show? The first episode is actually really quite simple because I wanted to concentrate more on... Uh, a few of the gadgets and introducing myself. So the first recipe is just very simple, like spaghetti with tomato sauce. But uh, you will see oven baked uh, Greek meatballs. You will see Greek lentil soup, Greek navy bean soup. You will see um, tzatziki, which for those who don't know is a garlicky yogurt sauce served with uh, meat or on pita bread souvlaki yeah souvlaki or gyro as the americans want to call it but it's really not gyro it's a gyro but anyways right. um <laughs> some greek <laughs> like i said language lesson <laughs> yes of course um oh yeah and i mentioned that actually on my episodes every time i talk about a recipe i will give them the greek pronunciation i'll explain a little bit of the history of the meal if i know it the origin um and we will be putting the entire recipe in the description box um so if we, if it doesn't come out clear by all means contact me or zoe and uh, we can uh, send you a copy of the recipe. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I mean, like I said, it's going to be a great show, I think. And I'm kind of hoping that Mary includes herself in that uh, round of shows. Because, I mean, the more shows we have, the greater our channel becomes. Absolutely. Um I don't, folks, I don't make any money on this channel. It is a network and the channel hosts get any money that's made, not me. Uh, so, you know, have, it'll be here to enjoy and uh, you guys should tune in. In the meantime, I want to thank Zoe for being my guest on the Meet Me series. Um... And again, f make sure you tune in on July 1st for Zoe's Blind Kitchen Corner. And 
check out it, check it out every Thursdays. And uh, we will see you guys next time. Wait. Thank what? you for having me. Oh. Thank you for having me. And thank you to everybody watching. And all my love and all my kisses. <laughs> I got that same call just a second ago. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully somebody will answer it. <laughs> Anyhow, right. love everybody. Yeah, thanks everyone. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. We hope you've enjoyed this interview on the Meet Me series here on Whose Blind Life Is It Anyway? Remember to like, share, and subscribe to the episode, to the channel, of course, and network. And again, make sure you tune in on July 1st for the premiere episode of Zoe's Blind Kitchen Corner here on Whose Blind Life Is It Anyway? and over on her channel, Zoe's Blind Kitchen Corner. Thanks for joining us, folks. We will see you next time.